The solemn entry of the emperor and empress into Paris on April 2nd was magnificent. The triumphal arch at the Etoile Barrier, under which the sovereigns passed, had been figured by a decoration which showed it as it would be when it was finished. The weather, which had been rainy the day before, had become fine, and a bright sun shed its rays on the procession, the troops, and the crowd of spectators, composed of almost the entire population of Paris. Their majesties were received at the Etoile Barrier by the prefect of the Seine Department and by the municipal body. The procession arrived at the Tuileries Palace by crossing the Champs-Élysées and the Garden, at the entrance to which a triumphal arch had been raised. After having rested in the drawing rooms of the palace and in the Diana Gallery, the procession proceeded towards the great Apollo drawing room of the museum, where a chapel had been installed. The queens of Spain, of Holland, and of Westphalia, Princess Eliza and Pauline carried the train of the Empress's mantle. Cardinal Fesch, the Grand Almoner, pronounced the nuptial benediction over the spouses. After the ceremony, the ladies who had placed the crown on the Empress's head removed it and the imperial mantle, which were carried back to Notre Dame by the first chamberlain, master of the wardrobe. This officer had been to fetch them in the morning with a ceremonial, which was also observed on the return of these insignia to the cathedral treasury, where they were to remain. Leaving the Apollo drawing room, the emperor, taking the empress's hand, placed himself with her on the balcony of the Pavillon de l'Orlage, where they were present at the march past of the various bodies of the Imperial Guard. A banquet was given in the theater, and their majesties listened to a concert, which was executed under the windows of the palace. This concert was followed by a display of fireworks, which reached right down to the whole length of the big avenue of the Champs-Élysées. A description of all the fetes given on the occasion of Napoleon's marriage with Marie-Louise would give but too feeble and imperfect picture of their magnificence and the enthusiasm of the Paris population. But they will be remembered for a very long time. The city of Paris wished the richness and beauty of its presence to correspond to the splendor of such a marriage. It offered a toilette table with all its fittings in silver gilt to the empress, the armchair and swing glass being also in silver gilt. This set had been carried out from the designs of the best artists and under their personal supervision. So perfect was this masterpiece that when Monsieur Balounet, steward of the Empress's purse, demanded it in her name in 1814, together with the cradle of the King of Rome, Count Bignon, who was at the time commissary of the police department, refused to hand them over. He alleged in refusing their restitution that it would be quite impossible to replace them, considering that the combination of circumstances which had given birth to these masterpieces could not present itself again, and that consequently the artists, in spite of all their talents, would be unable to produce work of equal beauty. This toilet table and accessories were melted down in 1832, and the money was used for relieving families who had suffered by the cholera, but the King of Rome's cradle was spared. Marie-Louise had it sent to her son, who had it placed in the imperial treasury at Vienna, where it still is. The present to Napoleon by the city of Paris consisted of a magnificent table, service in silver gilt. By order of the emperor, the 200,000 florins given by Austria as the dowry of Marie-Louise were paid into the public treasury. After the conclusion of the fetes and ceremonies, the court returned to Compiègne, where a grand diplomatic reception took place and distinguished foreigners were presented. Whilst there, Napoleon received many letters of congratulation from almost all the foreign courts. The castle of Compiègne had been decorated and furnished with an elegance and taste worthy of its destination. Amongst other rooms in Marie-Louise's occupation was a boudoir hung with a profusion of cashmeres of inestimable value. The princess had these cashmeres taken down later on, but as a matter of fact, they had only been placed there as a present to her and to be used as she thought fit. The Empress Josephine had enjoyed great liberty at home. She had many acquaintances. 
Her desire to serve the emperor and to increase his popularity prompted her to cultivate relations which she had preserved and to extend them. The emperor's marriage with a foreign princess who was not yet very experienced and was unknown to Parisian society made it, of course, necessary to modify this manner of life. And the household of the new empress had to be organized in a less independent manner. The precautions with which she was surrounded were taken in order to keep her away from all attempts at intrigue and coterie. But the isolation produced by these precautions brought with it grave disadvantages, which only became manifest later on. Napoleon appointed the Duchess of Montebello, widow of Marshal Lannes, who had been killed at the Battle of Essling, lady of honor to the Empress Marie Louise. He had hesitated some time between her and the Princess de Beauvau. Napoleon abandoned the idea of selecting Madame de Beauvau because he thought that it would not be wise to introduce into his court influences opposed to national ideas, influences to which a German princess in whom the prejudice of caste and of birth might be supposed to exist would have been subjected. Accordingly, he decided on the Duchess, thinking that he owed this mark of distinction to the memory of one of his oldest and bravest comrades in arms. His choice met with general approval. Madame de Montebello was 10 years older than the Empress, a very beautiful woman, cold, calm, and of irreproachable conduct. And in appointing her, the Emperor had said, I'm giving the Empress a real lady of honor. The Countess de Lusay, a gentle and offensive lady of great morality and excellent manners, became the mistress of the ropes. The interior service, which at that time of the Empress Josephine had consisted of four dames d'annonce, was augmented by two more ladies whose attributions were of a more austere nature. They were chosen from amongst the residents of the Ecouant Royale, or Tons's school, and Imperial House preference being given to the widows or daughters of officers. One of them, Madame Durand, was the widow of a general. They served the empress in the same way as the aides-de-camp served the emperor, except that they did not accompany her out of doors. They were consequently near the sovereign's person during the day, and during the night one of them slept in a room adjoining Marie-Louise's apartment. They allowed no man to enter her private apartment. Such were their orders. They were present at her drawing and music lessons. They wrote notes at her dictation or at her order and presided over the whole interior service. The Empress's private allowance was 2000 per month. 10,000 francs were distributed each month to the poor, this distribution taking place with prudence and after full inquiries had been made. The balance was used for toilet expenses. Marie-Louise was economical and took care never to exceed her allowance. She gave many presents and always kept in reserve in her writing table a purse of 1,000, which she never touched. The poets all vied with each other in celebrating the great event of the marriage. Fouché had given them a hint on this subject, but the emperor had blamed him because he did not wish to appear to have ordered these praises. Napoleon wished the authors to be left to their own inspirations, which moreover had no need of being stimulated. Later on, he made use of a sum of 100,000 francs, which was taken from his privy purse and distributed as proof of his satisfaction. Whilst the French muses interpreting the public feeling were paying their tribute of homage to the spouses, less sincere demonstrations were taking place at the castle of Valencay. Rivalry of adulation established itself there amongst the dithroned Spanish princes. A te deum was chanted in their chapel. They presided at a banquet given by themselves in honor of the emperor and empress, at which the most flattering toasts, accompanied by the most obsequious compliments, were drunk to the health of the royal couple. Added to the often repeated acclamations and cheers of Prince Ferdinand, the monitor which gave an account of this feast related that the prince proposed the health to their majesties in the following words, to the health of our august sovereigns, the great Napoleon and Marie-Louise, his august wife. 
a display of fireworks brought to a close, a fete, the magnificence of which could deceive nobody. To crown it in a worthy manner, Prince Ferdinand begged the emperor to adopt him as his son and to grant him the honor of allowing him to figure at his court. Such an entire want of dignity created a painful feeling everywhere. Another scene in which Fouché's police plate, the principal part, took place at the same time at the Chateau de Valencay. A certain Baron de Colley, furnished with instructions, powers, and monies by the Marquis of Wellesley, had been charged with the mission to help Ferdinand and the other Spanish princes to escape and to conduct them to Admiral Cockburn, who, with a small fleet, was awaiting the success of this attempt near the coast. The mission of the agent of the English government having become known, he was arrested. His credentials were put into the hands of a police agent who went and played the part of Baron de Colit de Ferdinand. But whether the Prince of Asturias had been secretly warned of the substitution, whether he suspected a trap or did not dare to risk the adventure, he received Fouché's agent very badly and reported him to the governor of the castle, the genuine Baron de Colli remained in prison in Vincennes until the return of the Bourbons, who restored him to liberty. After the success of the campaign in Spain, King Joseph had returned to Madrid and had been able to devote himself to the interior government of the country in which he had effected some useful reforms. Almost all the powers had acknowledged the new king and had addressed him letters of congratulation. Ferdinand had not failed to send his congratulations and had asked him to intercede for him with the emperor to induce him to grant him the hand of one of his nieces. The first military events which had happened in Spain had been favorable to our army. Saragossa had surrendered and important victories had been gained over the enemy. Suddenly, a new English army under Sir Arthur Wellesley, who afterwards became the Duke of Wellington, had joined the Portuguese troops and restored the confidence of the Spaniards. Our enemies assembled their forces to march upon Madrid, which they had hoped to surprise in a defenseless state. The king marched out of Madrid with his reserve corps to meet them and to join corps commanded by Marshal Soult, Ney, and Mortier. There were alternating successes and reverses. A disagreement which arose amongst the marshals was calculated to help the plans of the English general, their adversary. King Joseph, distinguished by other qualities, was not accustomed to war, and so precarious was the authority which he exercised over the leaders of the French army that he was unable to remedy the unfortunate effects of their disagreement. This campaign, which might have had decisive consequences, resulted nevertheless in checking the movements of the enemy and in throwing the Anglo-Portuguese army back into Portugal. Marshal Jourdain returned to France, and Marshal Soule, in whom the emperor had greater confidence, replaced him as major general to the king. The king had returned to Madrid, where his spirit of conciliation seemed to rally partisans around him, even amongst the Spaniards, whose opposition until then had been most marked. Military operations were being carried out with success on the east of the peninsula. Various successes secured in Aragon and the taking of Giron, a fortress in Catalonia which was defended by the Spaniards with as much obstinacy as Saragossa, brought this campaign to a successful close. After the fetes occasioned by his marriage, Napoleon, whose attention had been drawn to the Belgian provinces, determined to visit them together with that part of Holland which had recently been ceded to France. He had another object besides giving the Empress a change and showing her to the people of Belgium and its new provinces. The Emperor's principal object was to see what was going on with his own eyes, to judge of the effect which had been produced by the failure of the English expedition of Valkyrin, to see to what an extent the continental system was being violated there. He also wanted to find out what it was possible to do to remedy the damage caused to Dutch trade by the interruption of communications with England and to conciliate, as far as it was possible, the interests of the Netherlands with the rigor of his prohibitive laws. To understand the reasons which decided Napoleon to undertake this journey, it is necessary to speak of the causes which brought about the annexation to the empire of the districts situated on the right bank of the Escau, and in the end that of Holland. 
The emperor had seen how feebly the Dutch had cooperated in the defense of the island of Valkyrin against the English invasion under the command of Lord Chatham. He also saw that the authorities of this country did not check the circulation of English goods, with which smugglers and the English themselves during their temporary occupation of the island of Valkyrin had flooded the kingdom, not accepting the capital and the king's court. It has been seen that the king of Holland, Louis, sympathized but little with the emperor in the direction which the latter wished to give to the government of his states. The decree issued in Berlin on November 21st, 1806, which put England in a state of blockade, added to their disagreement. Such a measure seemed revolutionary to King Louis and calculated to ruin Dutch trade. He would not admit that this decree was a necessary and inevitable reprisal on the edicts of the Kingdom of England's council. His entire attention was devoted towards attenuating the injury which the blockade system would cause to Holland and to evade carrying it into effect as much as he could without appearing to violate it openly. To the complaints made to him about the facilities granted to English trade in the ports of Holland, he answered by saying that he could not prevent skin from perspiring. The effect of this opposition was that the emperor was seriously displeased. When Napoleon saw himself forced by the decrees of the British Council to take recourse to the system of continental blockade, it was evident that Holland could only preserve her independence by faithfully carrying out the system or by a maritime peace. The king's answer to the pressing requests of the emperor that he should close his ports to English trade was that the system of continental blockade would cause the ruin of Holland and that it would be better for her to unite to and incorporate herself with France, which would at least give her free communications with 40 millions of men. The king was asked to draw the attention of England to this state of things himself and to ask her to conclude peace so as to retain the advantages which she derived from the independence of the Dutch kingdom. With this in view, France's conditions were communicated to the English cabinet. These conditions were moderate ones. With Napoleon's consent, Monsieur La Boucher, sent by the King of Holland, left for London in February 1810. Fouché, who was ever on the lookout for the means of rendering himself indispensable, heard of the application which was being made to the London cabinet and of his own accord and without any other authority but his own began a second negotiation with Lord Wellesley without the knowledge of either King Louis or Napoleon. He charged Monsieur Ouvrard with this mission, but he did not satisfy himself with one intermediary alone and gave orders to another agent whom he had in London to enter into communications with the English minister. So many overtures aroused the suspicions of a minister who was but little disposed for peace, and he made haste to put an end to the negotiations by giving a negative answer to Monsieur La Boucher. The emperor then saw that in consideration of the safety of our frontiers and the strict carrying out of the continental system, he could no longer postpone the military occupation of the Dutch frontier. Communications between this country and England had not been interrupted, and British trade continued to find markets in the Dutch ports. Negotiations were entered into without further delay, and during the time when King Louis was at Paris, where he had been called at the same time as the other sovereigns allied to France, this prince, who was one of the most honorable men in his kingdom, but who had been embittered by vexations, domestic troubles, and infirmities placed between the duty which he owed to his brother and the rigidity of his principles, could not make up his mind to do violence to his feelings in these decisive circumstances. Neither prayers, nor advice, nor remonstrances, nor the promise to indemnify the Dutch for the sacrifice exacted from them, after peace should have been restored, could vanquish the king's scruples or induce him to give orders for the total exclusion of English trade. King Louis considered it his duty, his honor, and even his religion, interested in not allowing any sacrifice from which Holland might suffer, to be imposed upon him. 
or to admit any composition or pay any attention to the advantages which an unreserved cooperation in Napoleon's plans promised him. Some very sharp explanations took place between the emperor and his brother, and it was then that the former first threatened to occupy Holland by force. The king wrote to Holland to order that the French troops should be resisted by all means. Even by an inundation of the country, he forbade that any obedience should be paid to his orders if these orders were contrary to those mentioned, and commanded them to hold out until his return. 